Welcome back everyone to Reddish Bear Games, where we repair, mod, and refurbish retro video game systems and accessories. Or at least we usually do, because today we have a Xbox Elite Series 2 controller that doesn't work at all that we want to repair. Everything current will be retro eventually, right? So the eBay seller said that this controller doesn't power on. It looks like it's in decent shape. The, the thumb pads are a little gross, uh, but it's not awful. Um, and it came with its charger, but none of the back paddles or anything. So I suppose what we can do is verify the claim. I mean, obviously, Nothing. If I plug in its charging base, and attach it, I see a draw up here of 5.2 volts, but 0 0.1 amps, which is basically not charging. Just to rule out that, uh, it's the base or the, the pins on the back somehow. Same deal, 5.2 volts, 0 0.1 amps, and then it shuts off. So, wasn't misrepresented. Guess we're gonna have to go inside and uh, see if the fault is uh, correctable. Getting these open can be a bit of a pain. As you can see, there's no uh, screws externally visible. So what you have to do is use a pl plastic spudgers to uh, kind of pry the top case apart. Once you get the first snap, it seems to make it easier to get subsequent ones. But they aren't kidding when they say it, it does take some force. Just going around prying until I get the piece the parts to snap. And you can see there's actually some adhesive here too that doesn't help. But there we are. Top case comes off. From what I understand, this sticker here disintegrates when you um, attempt to unscrew this, which is an indicator as to whether anyone has been inside this controller before. It looks like not here. And it uses uh, security screws because of course it does. We can just uh, lift out the mid plane. Everything in this takes more force than you think it's going to. Okay. And the battery looks fine. 
It's not swollen. No signs of liquid or anything in here. So I'm going to guess that whatever is wrong with this has nothing to do with the actual battery. So we're looking at one of these two boards. This is the I.O. board for communicating with, um, with the console and other things. And this is a I think it's the main controller board for the controller. So what we're going to do is remove this, see if there's obvious damage we can repair. So it looks like we want to remove the bumpers. Be careful of these uh, motors here because they're just hanging on by wire. We want a spudger for this. There's a little clasp here. You can just slip that off. And it should go up. There's a um, clip here that you have to pull outward while pulling up on the bumper. Oop. <laughs> and the whole thing came, but that's fine. It didn't break. There. Okay. That wasn't terrible. Now those will flip up out of the way and I'll let us just pull this board up, I think. Unless there's something else holding it. Official instructions say to remove the thumbsticks. And they say to do that by using the cap as a screwdriver. But they also say it might require a little bit of force. So based on taking the front panel off, I expect that to be an understatement. The iFixit suggestion is to get it started with pliers as light, gently as possible to try and avoid scratching it. I think I agree with that assessment because this is not moving at all with the recommended method. Again, I don't think they intended anyone to work on this. Okay, even after getting it to start with the pliers, it doesn't want to move easily with the thumb screw, but it's moving now, slowly. All right, now we should be able to get this board out, finally. Still no. No, it got it. We got. I don't know what that is, but we'll figure it out. I'm thinking what we ought to do is uh, desolder these uh, now because if we're going to work on this anyway. We need to get it out of here and have it be able to lay flat. You can just uh, remove this uh, trigger and feed the wire around if you're doing something less invasive, but it's just as easy to take these off and put them back on, I think. See what we're looking at. Okay. 
kind of nasty looking. I don't know what that is. It's not sticky. We can see quite a bit on this side too. So um, I did some looking around the internet <clears throat> and found out that the, um, the weird powdery, I don't know, whatever this is that I took to be signs of water damage on the back here are apparently just a common Microsoft thing, like uh, part of their manufacturing process, I guess, if supposedly it's visible on boards going back to the 360 even. So um, I don't think that means the problem is back there. Uh, so where does that leave us? Well, the problem seems to be almost always this board. So if we can't spot anything terribly wrong with this, um, then we have to try other techniques. So how can we do that? Well, what I have here is a voltage injection tool. Um, we're going to look for a short on the board and, um, I did this earlier and uh, lost the recording, so I'm just going to go back over how I did it again. Um, first thing I do is uh, we attach uh, an alligator clip to, to a ground. The casing on this um, on this guy will do just fine. Then we attach a positive lead to the voltage injector. You can't see this and there's no good way to show it to you, but um, this voltage injector is basically it's a bench power supply of sorts. Um, it can set it, it's configurable level of voltage and amps. Um, I don't want to blow the thing up, so I'm not going to set it real high. I'm going to set it for three volts at one amp. All we need to do is uh, just determine whether there's heat being generated or not. And finally, power in on this connector here. DC in is the second pin from the left on the top row facing this way. So what we're going to do is just apply power by touching that point and then figure out where we see heat. And how do we do that? I've got two ways. Uh, the first is we're going to use a uh, thermal camera. Uh, I'll see how well I can show it to you. Um, this is not the highest resolution device. High resolution thermal cameras are incredibly expensive, but what it will do is make it evident if there is a problem when we apply power and hopefully it will show us uh, the general area we need to look in. All right, so here we go. Second pin. And immediately we see a heat spot form. I lift up the power and it starts to fade. Power, fade. Power, fade. So clearly we have a short of some form over here. Once we know where to look, now we have to find the specific component. And I've, I've got the microscope pretty far in here because these parts are tiny. And the resolution of the thermal camera is not good enough to show me which specific part is the problem. So what we can do is position the camera roughly where the heat spot appeared to have been, and we'll use some IPA. 
We'll just flood the area with alcohol and then apply power to generate the heat again. And you see that? As soon as I apply power, the alcohol retreats from a specific part. You see it return when I pull the power away, but spray it directly, power. So this appears to be our shorted capacitor. Okay, so I'm going to try and show you the, uh, the multimeter. as we test these points. Okay, we're talking about this guy. So what we should see is that one side is shorted or is to ground and the other is not. But we see on this guy that both sides appear shorted. And what we can't tell, so see, you'll find more than one that looks shorted when you test this way. And that's part of the problem because it's in circuit. A short in one part can make others look shorted when they aren't. Um, that's where the, uh, the heat test can be useful. So the heat tells us that this guy is probably the issue. So what we'll have to do is remove that and see if our problem goes away. That is an incredibly tiny little capacitor. Okay, so we've removed the capacitor we suspect of being shorted. Clean that up a little bit. And now what do we see? We see that the ground plane, of course, is ground, but this is no longer showing short. Right, and neither is that anymore, as we'd expect. So, does it uh, power on? Let's see if removing that capacitor is enough to let it turn on. There's a good chance it will be. And look at that. And if we attach it to uh, the battery, we can see that it starts to charge. So, uh, this probably would work okay now, um, though we should replace that capacitor. Uh, only problem is I don't know what the value is. Um, I don't have a donor and uh, I can't find any kind of capacitor map for an LE controller. So I'm going to have to look around and see if I can find someone who can find the value. 
I can't read the, the value of this uh, already failed one. And unfortunately, that's about as far as I can take this repair. Um, if this were a customer controller or unit, um, then I would have to replace the capacitor for sure, um, probably with a donor, uh, because I looked everywhere online to try and figure out what the rating of this capacitor is so that I could find a suitable replacement, and I just can't. Um, if anyone out there knows what it might be, um, I'd love to know. <laughs> um, but I don't have a donor for this, and uh, because it isn't for a customer and it's mine, I wanted a second Elite 2 if I could make one work. Um, I'm gonna just wing it and try using it without the capacitor. Um, this capacitor is a decoupling capacitor, which means that its primary function is uh, more or less to reduce the noise on the signal line. Um, and and it's found behind the, the CPU through a via on the back. So it's attached to a CPU pin uh, to reduce noise on that, the CPU's signal pin. Um, it probably will work without it. Um, I don't really know what, the, what that pin even is doing or what the effect will be, but since it's mine, I'll take the risk. So um, all I can do is put it back together and then test it and um, go from there, I suppose. So we're going to uh, reassemble the unit. Pro tip, when you're putting this back together, make sure you've uh, you've put the uh, headphone assembly under the board before you screw it down, unlike me. Here's another pro tip, uh, make sure all the buttons seem to depress appropriately before you put it back together. Another pro tip, uh, these rumble motors are not the same size. Uh, I don't know if it actually matters which side they go back on, but um, the when I disassembled this, the one with the larger counterweight was um, on the side with the D-pad. There's a possibility that, it that one of these takes more current than the other to operate because of the size difference so maybe the board is expecting it to be in a particular place or maybe 
Maybe there's a feel reason why. I don't know, but um, I prefer to keep it original. Like, there might be a reason. So it's almost fully assembled again, but uh, this is the point now that the battery's connected where we can reasonably test this thing. I felt the rumble, charging light. All good. And now we can see what the computer thinks of it. See the joystick works well. Seems perfectly calibrated. Buttons are working. Um, the profile button works. Okay. And do the sticks click? Yes. Yes, perfect. Everything looks good. Can we test rumble here? I think we can. I hope you can see when I do that, but both motors are spinning just fine so looks like we have full functionality and uh, this cable is just power i'm actually connected to the computer wirelessly so that's showing us that the bluetooth is even working so uh all that's left is the final button up this thing's look uh looking great And there we have it, an Xbox Elite 2 wireless controller saved from the scrapyard uh, by the simple removal of a faulty capacitor. Um, uh, we uh, ventured a little outside of my usual um, haunting grounds of retro gaming with this, because this is certainly not retro yet. Uh, but still, I thought you might be interested in seeing some of the debugging techniques, and um, I hope you enjoyed that. We'll do something different next time. Take care.